The new presenting sponsor for On Education is Classcraft. The world is changing and so is the classroom. Real learning only happens when students are deeply engaged. Now more than ever, it's important to make school relevant and meaningful to today's students in order to prepare them for the future. Start gamifying your classroom for free today. To learn more about Classcraft, simply visit classcraft.com. Having fun is fun, guys. <laughs> bring the weird. We, we, let's bring the weird, right? <laughs> let's bring the weird. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss the Apple special event held last week and the looming teacher walkouts in Oregon, North Carolina, and Kentucky. We'll talk about why instructional coaches work so well in some districts while failing miserably in others. And our guest this week is friend of the podcast, expert in many educational areas, and all-around amazing guy, Noah Geisel. So I took karate class this week. Oh, I've started karate. What, is it just like karate karate or is it, you know how they have all these different is there other forms kinds of, karate? of it? Yeah. Oh, see, I don't know enough about it yet. Yeah. Well, I, I know that there's like, uh, I can't even get jujitsu. Yeah, don't even try. No, don't even try. I think it's one of them. <laughs> You'll just man. embarrass yourself. I can't think of the other ones, but I think well, there's that, different I think forms. I don't think that's karate though. Jujitsu is its own thing. Karate karate might be just, yeah. Might be it's karate. okay. Yes. I think there are other kinds of karate, okay. but I don't know. Anyways, I, I did my first lesson and my arms are very sore. Wow. Uh, which is not, well, I guess it's good. My wife says it's good and, you know, I believe my wife. So yeah, soreness is good. It's good. We're trying to get healthy. We're both exercising a lot more. We're trying to be healthier in our 40s, which we're not 40 yet for the record. Uh, but we're going to be healthier in our 40s than we were in our 30s. It's it's important. So so starting I'm, with I'm exercise trying, and then I'm trying to drink less pop Ooh. soda. No, we we call it pop too in Minnesota. Though when I was in the Southwest, we call it Coke. I think we've had this conversation right. before. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like calling um like tissues Kleenex. Exactly. Which we would I would call it probably a Kleenex as well. I would call it a Kleenex or also. Yes. Band-Aid. What other ones? Band-Aid. And when I moved to the Midwest, it was definitely pop. So, I've adopted that word too. Do you have a soda stream? I do not. I I do enjoy though I've I've tried to substitute <laughs> tried uh as much mm-hmm. As I can, uh, uh, that basically sparkling water drinks. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. They are good. We've thought about yeah. it. Are you getting one? So I have one. Okay. We just don't use it very much. We used it a lot at the start when we bought it a couple of years ago, but it's been in the basement now since we moved here. So it's been in three years at least. Um, Breaking it out? But I think so because I think what I'm realizing is that I don't necessarily like, you know, the sugary nature of pop. I don't care about flavors or whatever i care i like the carbonation yeah so like i can drink carbonated water i like perrier i like i like carbonated water so i think i just want to like get some calorie no zero sugar whatever additive to spray into my water and then carbonate it and then i'll have like tahiti is there tahiti treat in the united states that's like the carbonated fruit punch nope it's a pop heard of it (laughs) Tahiti it's an old what? brand. I don't. It's called Tahiti Treat. Ooh, I want some of that. <laughs> yeah, no. It's it's basically fruit punch. Okay, but it's but carbonated. Carbonated. It's pop. Hmm. It's so good. Okay. So Tahiti. I'm gonna get some. I'm gonna get some fruit punch flavored whatever and spray it into a bottle and then pump it up and and I'll have I'll make my own zero calorie punch, water right? drink. Right. Yes. Yeah, buddy. So, so trying that's to drink exciting. less pop, exercising yeah. more, eating, eating trying to better. eat better salads for lunch. All right. So and intermittent fasting, which is, I, I guess is a thing. Yeah, I uh-huh. tried to do it a lot back in uh, when I was about 33, 34. I got into really, really good shape and I used intermittent fasting. Yeah, there you go. So that's happening. Do it. Too. <laughs> so we're working on it because that's, I think, the biggest thing I need to, to work on in my personal life so there you go and now everyone else knows too all right we'll we'll be here Uh, to support you 
sweet okay. we have this is the big announcement episode this is huge announcements we have like basically four big announcements that's a lot so yeah <laughs> that's yeah. better than the spe- apple special event <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they just it added is. plus to everything <laughs> right right so we don't have a credit card i would take a credit card that's true announcement <laughs> The on education credit card yeah, yeah. coming soon. <laughs> so, so the first big announcement um, is that we have a new presenting sponsor. Whoa! What'd you say? <laughs> Actually, they just heard it. They just heard the ad. Right. So, yes, we have a we have a new presenting. Oh, yes, because they would have. Yes. yes, they would have yeah, just heard the exactly. ad. We have a new presenting sponsor, as you just heard, Classcraft. So psyched about this. Um, it's not just going to be talking. At the start of the podcast, we're doing a lot of work with them. I think what we're excited about the most with this is that we both, both Classcraft and you and I, wanted this to be a partnership. Absolutely. um, Where we work together on a bunch of different things. So that's going to happen. We're going to be working with them at some events. I don't know if it's going to be like emceeing things, but we're going to be present a, a lot more with Classcraft and working with them. Um, you're going to see some minor changes to things on the website and maybe even like some Twitter stuff. But we really, really, not only are these folks awesome people. They're which, amazing people. Yes. All of them. Even the, the folks, that, uh, every conference, these guys, the, the, these folks come to these conferences and travel around. I don't know how they're not exhausted, uh, but it's almost always the same people. And they're amazing. They're awesome folks. We're, we're, we're going to be seeing them all over the place. And, and that part is, is so, so good. But, you know, they're going to be rolling out a whole bunch of cool stuff, lots of great deals. And we really believe in Classcraft. And I think that that's the best thing about it, right? Yeah, yeah. We believe in the product. That's it's, that's why it's so going to be so special for us. We're more than happy to talk about it because we know it actually works. So right. that that is an amazing partnership when you have that as a as a sponsor of uh you know in this case our podcast. Yep. My wife was giving me quite a hard time about not talking about the Gong Show that is education policy in Ontario, uh, and I kept saying to her, "Listen, we're waiting." I'm waiting to talk. I want to talk. I want to have someone on that can actually talk about this in a really meaningful way. And I don't think we could possibly have gotten someone better than who we got. So we've booked Merit Styles. Merit Styles is, and this is going to be hard for Americans maybe to to figure out, but um, a a little Canada 101, which is a a very good segment on, on education once in a while. Merritt Stiles is the shadow minister for education for the gov- for, for Ontario. So she would be uh, a member of the opposition party, but her main uh, responsibility is to respond to what the government is doing in regards to education. Uh, so we basically got the best possible person to come on and talk to us about what's going on in Ontario. We're going to talk about uh, class sizes, because that's a huge issue in Ontario. Uh, we're talking about the cell phone ban mm. in Ontario. We're talking about we're talking about full day kindergarten being um, canceled, possibly, or at the very least, there's this rumor that they're going to basically get rid of kindergarten teachers from the classroom entirely and just wow. do do ECE teachers, early childhood education people wow. in junior kindergarten in particular. Uh, so lots of really big, really bad decisions are and happening. We, those are related topics in the U.S. too. So it's perfect. It's it's really yeah. scary what's going on. Uh, and so um, so Merit is is going to be on, and we're really excited uh, to have her. We're recording uh, her on April 10th, and she will be on the episode that we will release on April 16th. So in a couple weeks. There was a really big Apple event this it week. It was the Apple special event. They you... they really do that thing up, don't they? It's a oh, it's, it's a it's train. a production. It's a uh, it's like an award ceremony sure, to yeah. themselves. <laughs> yeah, Tim Cook is the conductor of the hype train. <laughs> Did you see that they had like Sesame Street on there and, and Oprah? I mean, it was, 
Oh my god, it, everybody Steven Spielberg maybe was on there too. Right. I mean, they bring in the big people. <laughs> you bring in Big Bird, Oprah, and Steven Spielberg. It's going to be a Apple special event. I know. It's definitely a special event. <laughs> they definitely go for it when they yes. when they do these things. Uh are you excited about Apple Arcade? I want to know more about it, uh especially what the price point is. Mm-hmm. Uh cuz I just wrote I mean, I was thinking about this and I was I was saying, is it yet just another subscription? Because that's what it's a subscription model. You get to play all of their games uh, that they have available. And, and the way that they're hyping it up, they're saying that it's all of these amazing new, some of them new games. But I have also right. read that they are bundling third party things like Minecraft or, you know, the, the NBA 2K games or Grand Theft Auto or whatever it is, the, the normal kind of very... Uh, heavily played games and they're bundling those into this and then you pay a certain amount for it Mm -hmm. and then they're going to redistribute it to the developers somehow uh depending upon the number of hours that people are playing it so i don't know i i don't know if does renting games is that a big industry you know what i mean i mean playstation plus yeah but i'm just saying xbox games with gold is pretty popular yeah (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you get Xbox think, Live and you get the games of gold and you actually get to keep them, though. So they don't take well, them Well, until away. your subscription expires. That's true, actually. So, but everybody that plays the consoles plays live. You know what I mean? Yeah. The big yeah, difference so, is that it's mobile games. Mobile games, yes. Right. Yep. So that, that's kind of the problem. Now, the, the biggest problem with Apple Arcade, obviously, is that... Um, you know, when Apple released, you know, the the game store, the app store, and let all of these garbage free to play games on, and now now they're like going to try to reverse the ship and say now we're focusing on quality. Hmm. Um, but they've kind of they might be past a point of no return as far as the the quality question is concerned. We'll see. I mean because that's one of the big focuses they were they were talking about it like these are going to be amazing games amazing games yes and don't have to worry about that uh where you start playing a game you get to level 20 and now you have to start putting in a lot of money into it (laughs) right which you know generally sucks yes big time speaking of amazing games um we came across this article uh pax east i think that's what they call it is happening. It was happening in Boston last week, and, and so you're you're getting a, a little bit of games news squeak out uh, from that. And um, an article came across about a role playing game that kind of has a bit of a different focus, right? Yeah, I mean, it it they describe it basically as a kind of like the games that we play sometimes, like a, mm-hmm. a World of Warcraft kind of thing, an old school World of Warcraft. Uh, games where you have battalions and you're moving them uh, against another army. But the really cool aspect of this is that you have to take into consideration your soldiers' mental health and make sure that you are uh, addressing their concerns and, and the things that are happening with them, or otherwise you can't actually successfully win a battle, which it's really, really an interesting uh, concept and i hadn't seen that specifically addressed especially not in these types of games one of the things that i used to go on about all the time was that we have all of these war games um call of duty you know battlefield and, and stuff like that and the problem i had with them in some cases was that it it glamorized war without showing the reality of war of of you know, um, battles and, and how brutal, like you had call of duty, you know, even back in the day when it was like a world war one game, world war one was awful in so many ways. Like more people died of disease than died of fighting in Mm -hmm. world war one. That should tell you enough about how brutal world war one is, but you don't really get a sense of that from playing call of duty. And, And I know that we play our games and they're meant to be entertaining, but I think that they were, they were missing, the boat as far as you know what they could have what messages they could have been sending and so actually battlefield one that came out just you know a year or two ago Mm -hmm. did a quite a did quite a bit better job of uh, especially those opening scenes did quite a bit better job of portraying war as being brutal 
and in a storyline yes right 100 like player storyline yes 100 percent. so i like this i like the idea that the results of the combat affect the mental health of the participants and you can your participants can come down with ptsd and that's a that's a real thing right in combat absolutely uh you can you there's morale um so this is actually a pretty interesting take on on mental health uh and combining it with uh video games that that i embrace i mean this may not end up like i mean it's an indie studio and whatever so this might not be the game that really pushes it out ends out ends up being the one to break through all the noise but I think that as more people think about this stuff, you're going to see eventually some big commercial game, hopefully really hit on this and it become something where people, you know, acknowledge and realize and, and embrace um, it, it, it. Anything that furthers the conversation is good. So I'm really excited to take a look at this. They're out of Ontario. They're they're know, they're local. That. They're local to me. So I might um I Did might get a hold of them. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Even if I can just play it um early and uh and get a handle on it and then maybe talk about it uh, again. That would be that would rock. Get us some, yeah. get us some copies. Right, right. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm we're gonna put this in the show notes uh so you can take a look too. Uh, I think it's really, really cool. More teacher walkouts are coming, Glenn. Yes. We're 100% supportive of any of these states uh, and their teacher associations that decide to go ahead and do this. In this case, we're talking about North Carolina and Oregon, at least in this first article that you'll, you're you going to read out of Education Week, are the two states that, are, that they have walkouts looming. Uh, I see that there is a May 1st day of action for North Carolina, which could be mm. a day that they actually walk out. And in May 8th in the state of Oregon, uh, where they are urging teachers to go ahead and walk out in protest of basically, again, really bad proposed state budgets that uh, are going to affect teachers. They're going to be teacher cuts. Uh, the same topics that you're talking about, Mike, uh, more mm-hmm. students in the classrooms, less uh, pay, uh, and all of the different types of things that we know that are affected directly by just legislation that doesn't fully fund education. So we have that in North Carolina and Oregon. The really interesting one, and we'll make sure we link that too, is is happening or has happened in Kentucky where they're not exactly walking out. They basically are calling in sick. And what these teachers wanted to do is, is have the opportunity to go to Frankfurt, the uh, capital of Kentucky to have their voices heard. And they weren't getting the release time or something like that. Something happened. And then a whole bunch of these teachers decided that they were just going to call in sick. So a sick out would be mm. the, the official term there. And so it happened. And then their, uh, whoever there is, their ed department of education leader uh, there in Kentucky has said that he wants the list of all of the teachers <laughs> that called in sick that day and talking about things like he wants doctor's notes and whatever it might be. And and even people on the uh, state school board of education have said that's not a good idea and he's still not backing down from it. So a bunch of these teachers are fearing retribution from them. Basically, the reason why they called in sick is basically to have their voices heard. And it's exactly what you've been talking about too, Mike, as far as we want to make sure that our voices are heard. People know and understand the, the, the exactly what's happening in the classrooms. And then sometimes the only way to be able to do that is actually go face to face at the Capitol and just say, Hey, all of us are here together and we're, and, and we're here in protest of, of what's occurring as far as the way that you're funding education and, you know, all of our pay, salary, benefits, and then all of the things that are happening within our schools themselves. The idea that the head of education of Kentucky would, would basically like almost give a veiled threat uh-huh. to teachers is um, pretty pathetic. Uh, Doug Doug Ford has done kind of the same uh, in Ontario with uh, threatening teachers if they decide to strike or do any job action. We're going to talk to Merritt about that. 
uh it's pretty bad that's your 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 leaders your political leaders should not be threatening your teachers no um, <laughs> that's a sad it should, it, it's funny it should go without saying it's uh, it's unbelievable that you even say it right exactly but, uh, but here we go but it's so, happening yes absolutely uh finally this is actually a kind of an interesting conversation almost because i'm thinking about it i've been thinking about it all morning actually this should teacher training include theater courses where where did this come from actually i was just perusing twitter as i usually do and i saw pictures of our former guest a couple of weeks ago brian mm-hmm. aspinall yep. and he was doing a training and actually well, maybe was it a training it was basically teaching some students let's just see what it is he was teaching some students about something i don't even know what it was but it doesn't really okay. even matter because what i really saw was a bunch of pictures that were being taken by somebody else a third party a teacher or somebody within the school would just taking pictures of him teaching these students and there was a combination of two things going on number one is his facial expressions and body gestures and the students' facial expressions were of that of a group of people that are fully engaged in whatever was going on. That's why I said it doesn't even matter what he was actually teaching, which I'm sure was amazing content that he's actually presenting. But there's something to that as far as having someone that is a dynamic personality uh, and that knows how to go ahead and basically present in a way that draws in an audience. Um, right. And then it, as I was thinking about that, my wife told me, hey, I've just I read an article about that a while back. And it was about Penn and Teller, the, the magicians. Sure. Uh, and they actually have an article that that talks about how some about the magic in the classroom, you know, and there's this great quote, basically, Teller says, the teacher has a duty to engage, to create romance that can transform apathy into interest. And if a teacher does her job well, a sort of transference of enthusiasm from teacher to student takes place. That's what I call the the, the teaching magic. And, and the reason why I even then thought of this is we were having a discussion is like, what are the things that you learn in a theater course versus teaching courses? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and it brings out things like that are so important. Things like having a stage voice, uh, yeah. a sort of strength there, being clear and precise in how you speak and what you say so that you're, so that you're, yep. So that your directions and that your, uh, whatever your content that you're, that you're, uh, speaking about is actually clearly understood that you have a presence. So a stage presence. Yeah. Uh, and then she, we also talked about that good performers, if you're performing for an audience, like a comedian or an improv person or a singer, whatever yeah. it might be, you look out into your audience's eyes. And if you're really good, you know whether or not what you're doing is 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 actually engaging them. And if it's not, you tweak things to fit your audience. So as as you you're like okay cool they love this I'm gonna go ahead and give them more of this or nope this this class doesn't is not uh, receptive to this I'm adjusting I'm gonna give them some of this other stuff so it's a really important skill and I I was like oh we should actually have these courses that are taught at the university level uh, for our, our incoming teachers so that they develop these skills and they have they have that ability to be able to reach their students in hindsight. I think I wish I had had it because definitely my personal growth, my professional growth right now is focused a lot on delivery of content to groups of people. I'm doing a lot of PD. I travel a lot on. I'm speaking at a lot of conferences and and stuff like that. I'm doing yeah, sessions super all the time. Yeah. I, I actually have thought about joining uh, Toastmasters, uh, the, a local Toastmasters guild. Yeah. to 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 talk to learn how to deliver effective speeches and, and stuff like that so uh, i'm thinking about this quite a bit and it's definitely a learned skill like this is something you can i'm way better at it now than i was three or four years ago when i first started doing public speaking uh so i think in hindsight this would have been great and i see the value because I think that that transference of enthusiasm is is huge. I, I love that sentence, that mm-hmm. phrase. It's really good. Transference, trans, because we know passionate teachers create passionate students. Yes. 
we know this. And so when I do PD, for example, part of my job is building excitement. I call it, I, I actually have a deck that I, that I do typically before I do PD and I call it the hype deck because it's literally just about trying to get people excited about what they're about to do. I want them to be excited before we start talking about, you know, this is the power button for dash. This is what you do. Like there is some of that stuff and it's important that when I'm teaching it, they need to learn that stuff. But I want people to be excited about learning it. Absolutely. And and we know that. And we know that about teachers and we know that about PD and we know that about students. So I think that there's some merit to this. And I think it'd be really, really cool to have a, an optional course, an elective in your B ed where it's, it's about delivery and, 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 and style. And um, what do they call that in, in ministry? Actually, there's, there is a course related to delivering the delivery of a sermon, the creation and delivery of sermons. I cannot remember the, there's an actual term hmm. for it that maybe someone can, tell us i want to use the word homiletics but i'm not sure that's the word but that's a related word to this but anyways in in ministry in in the christian faith anyways there is um a course that you take at at bible college or whatever you want to call it that is related to the actual crafting and delivery of sermons and i don't think in some ways that there's a lot of dissimilarity between the two in terms of the what you're trying to do we just get people excited and 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 motivated to 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 learn and and do something so yeah super super interesting what's the difference between what a good instructional coach does and a bad instructional coach or what's the difference between why one is effective and one isn't that's what we're going to talk about next so stay tuned do you have plans to attend the isti conference this summer Come one day early and participate in the best hidden gem conference in the United States. Badge Summit 2019 will take place on the Temple University campus in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on June 22nd. There will be lots of wicked smart educators to collaborate with on topics such as digital badges, credentials, gamification, and more. To learn more about Badge Summit, simply visit bit.ly slash badge summit. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Our favorite person that has not been on the podcast yet, <laughs> Corey, Corey Graham. Mm-hmm. Hi, Corey. Had a question on Twitter, and it created one of the most lengthy and detailed conversations on Twitter I've probably been engaged in in quite a long time, in fact. And she threw it to us to talk about on the podcast, But I think we learned a lot about the conversation from Twitter. And the question was, why do instructional coaches work so well? Or why are they so positively received in some districts or schools, I guess? Mm -hmm. While in other districts, they fail miserably or are not seen as necessary. So it's a great question. I think that (laughs) it is a great question. And I would like to think that you probably have a lot of thoughts on this. I do. And we'll start off with what Corey was proposing as a as a, a, posi- a possible reason why they are successful in some districts and fail in some other districts. Mm-hmm. Her reasoning was uh, that she believes that it's possible it might be associated with school size. Um, hmm. And... I kind I kind of know where she's coming from. Uh, the previous school district that I taught at was a K through 12 school district in one building. So if you want to imagine that there's only 900 total kids or so from pre-K through 12, about 40 students, 40 to 50 students per grade is right. what is what it was. It was called a two section school. Basically, you have two teachers per grade. Sure. Um, and anyway, it was small enough that. We didn't have an instructional coach coach, uh, slash technology integrationist. And eventually, I saw that there was a need for that. Mm -hmm. And I proposed to our administration that I should just continue teaching. Uh, Let me move some of my classes to an online method. And then let me go ahead and 
take over as this technology integrationist, which is different than the tech person that we had hired for the district. So it's different than a person that is uh, fixing all of the tech or uh, being able to go ahead and you know push out technology, uh, be able to work on servers and those kinds of things. And instead, it's a person that's working directly with teachers on, we had a one-to-one uh, 7 through 12 program there. And so I wanted to help those teachers use the technology the best they could. And so that they did allow me to do that for some extra pay, right? And it was okay received. <laughs> mm-hmm. There was still some people that were very, they were, they thought that I was on the ends with the admin or something or Right. There was now you're of, one of them. Yeah, some sort of conspiracy was happening, or yeah. I don't know what was what was going on. And so it was this kind of small school. It's one of the reasons why I left, actually, because I wanted to pursue this specific career of being an instructional coach, being a tech integrationist, at, and at a place where this was already happening. So that was her possible uh you know, plausible reason why this happens. But my goodness, there was a lot of things on, as far as the responses on it were of a varied all over the place, but so, some really good things on there too. So one of the things that came up was this idea that the role itself is confused sometimes between someone who is tech support and someone who supports teachers using technology in the classroom. And those aren't the same rules. And I mean, newsflash, they actually require a completely different, you know, set of education and skill set. Yes. uh, And and level of knowledge about different things. Um, I can guarantee you that a lot, most technical uh, instructional technologists or technology, technology coaches uh, aren't certified to troubleshoot your hardware, your problems. No. And we don't want to be. <laughs> no, because it's not your job. But we we heard a pretty brutal story about, um, you know, one person in particular who talked about um, being shoehorned into roles that ended up being basically tech support. Yes. They were instead hired as, of, yep, as a the, coach. Right. Yeah. And, that's scary to me. Like, I mean, I, I said, I said to this person, I, I'd be a, as you could probably imagine, I'd be a rage machine, is what I said. Yeah. If if I got hired to be a instructional coach, and ended up being tech support. Yeah, and I, I I'd think, lose it. Yeah, clearly defining what the roles are and really supporting that definition is so important. So saying, hey, you're going to specifically work with educators on these specific things, and here's how we're going to delve it out, and we're going to make sure 100% support it. I'm talking about the admin. Um, Mm -hmm. And if that happens, man, it's magical because it's happening where I work at. That doesn't mean, though, and that's what I want to make sure everybody knows, it doesn't mean that there's not resentment and that – you don't hear whispers from people going like, why do we even have those positions? Like, you know, so there is people who still have resentment towards it, that they don't want it to exist and that they, and for a variety of reasons, you know, one, they don't understand what the position is. Two, they don't feel like there's any value in it, you know, that you can actually give mm-hmm. them any value. Three, as Corey said, some people just don't, they don't want any advice. They don't, yes. they feel like, oh, they're, yeah. I mean, they feel like they're doing great. And uh-huh. and they also feel like they actually do have a growth mindset, even though they don't want any, you know, uh, help or mentorship or anything else like that. They they want to do it themselves, or they want to do it on their own terms. Um, so they don't understand this kind of culture of being able to work with somebody else and those kinds of things. So that's an important thing, and and that was a a very well thought out point too. Again, by Corey and some of the other people posting on here, and I like that some people were describing what they were experts at, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike? So like you just said, we're describing teachers who have master's degree in a specific content areas. They are, they're great at instruction and pedagogy, Mm -hmm. and they can share a lot of different uh, advice and skills and help you develop things. And that's really what we wanted to go ahead and turn into by we, I mean, uh, us that work in this kind of field, we want to support teachers in what they're doing and basically uh, help them grow in their profession 
and and be there for them for a variety of different things, but not for fixing tech. And that's the that's the big one that's still a hang up in many many districts. So, and this has a lot to do with trust. Absolutely, as, as does uh, so many things related to education. But um, teachers need to trust that the instructional coaches all they're all that they are there for is to make your job easier to make you more productive to help you be more productive not necessarily even i'm um, using the wrong word i don't want to say make and i wanted to i i didn't chime in on this because i ended up getting getting busy but the idea of framing this as mentorship as opposed to coaching i think that there's a mind that you get into when you think of a coach in some cases that could be not as well received as someone who is perceived as a, a mentor. And so I thought that that was a little bit interesting. And some people would say, you know, I don't, especially new teachers should want a mentor and maybe don't necessarily want a coach. Those, those are two different kind of uh, mindsets maybe. So there's a, there's a lot of really interesting things and every, every district is different. I think that that's one of the things we also learned from this conversation is that it's really hard to put your thumb down on it because, um, because they're so different. And that's, I mean, I guess that was the whole point of Corey's initial message was that, you know, in some places it's working in some places it's not. And like you said, there's, there's a culture of coaching and mentorship that, that is super important. We should have actually talked, to Carl about this because I'd love to hear how, you know, a district like Eanes, which is known to be one of the best districts in the United States for technology integration, how their technology integration specialists and their tech coaches are perceived by the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested in knowing, you know, his thoughts on that. So maybe, uh, I'll ping Carl and see if he can listen to this part and then respond. That might be worthwhile too. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and and I would want to know specifically too what kind how in depth do they get with their teachers? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So are they actually working side by side? Are they co-planning or is it some kind of thing where you're stepping back a little bit and then letting just giving advice and those kinds of things but you're not really actually in the classroom so that's that would be the thing it's because a lot of us want to actually be back helping teachers by observing them giving feedback uh co-teaching possibly helping yeah. with instructional plans you know all of those types of things to be able to develop great lessons there absolutely so let's keep the conversation up twitter responding here maybe chat on education we didn't yeah. even talk about oh, that. We didn't even say anyway. that. This is a perfect so maybe segue. We'll, we'll, maybe, <laughs> maybe, hint, hint, maybe one of the questions will be on the next chat on education. We should we throw it out that. there for sure. On uh, Thursdays. When we, on Thursdays, questions at 9, 12, and 3. Join us. Anyways, when we come back, we'll be joined by Noah Geisel. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. We're thrilled to be joined today by best friend of the pod, one of the best friends of the pod. Woo. I don't want to alienate anybody, but Noah Geisel is in the house. Yes. Great to be here, guys. Thank you. So excited to be back with you. So I think I think now you've recaptured the record. This is third time for Noah, right? Yeah, I, I'm your Justin Timberlake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means yet. No, it's but Saturday Night I, Live. I, I, Doesn't he always come back or something? <laughs> there you go. Okay. So our Justin Timberlake, uh, Noah Geisel, is is here. And we've got lots of uh, really cool stuff to talk about. Um, we have announcements to make and um, new things to introduce. So so let's, let's do that. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is Badge Summit. So Noah has a lot of things to tell us about Badge Summit. So uh, when and where is Badge Summit 2019, Noah? Yeah, guys, 2019 Badge Summit is going to be in Philadelphia on June 22nd and the Temple University campus. This will be the fourth ever Badge Summit. Just a full day exploration of all things digital badge credentials, 
gamification, um, just lots of really smart, humble, amazing thinkers, um, just learning and sharing together for a full day, super cheap. Uh, everybody will be able to get the details at bit.ly slash badge summit. That's awesome. That's amazing. So this is the Saturday before ISTE. Exactly. It's a and great it's way Temple. to start off that, that week. My goodness. Right? Yes. Uh, well, one of the, the great things about Badge Summit last year that uh, we were just talking off air was that it's it's basically, you know, 100 or 200 or I guess it was a little more than that. of Some of the smartest people that I've ever met. Like, it's just a bunch of wicked smart people talking about wicked smart things. And I, I love, I loved Badge Summit. I loved listening to the people talk. Uh, Glenn was on a panel. I was. And with some amazing people. I mean, Audrey O'Claire was moderating. Damon yeah. Torgerson, who has been on the show before from yep. Aludo. And of course, the the special, most special person there, Michael Matera. <laughs> uh, and we, <laughs> we were all on this panel and speaking about badging and, and our differences, our different takes about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was amazing and wonderful. And I really like that, uh, the potential for awesome conversations to be able to happen in the halls and it doesn't feel like it's a big gigantic uh moving force like isti is you know so you can actually it, it's more take it easy be able to have great conversations with people and not feel like pressure like you have to get to a session or those types of things speaking of sessions no i, I are the sessions have some of the session like speakers been confirmed do you have a keynote speaker I have a keynote, um, and I, I think you may know this person. Minu Rami is oh keynoting. Oh, my goodness. Nice. <laughs> you didn't tell us before. I was like, who <laughs> can this be? Minu. That's fantastic. That'll be cool. Yes. I We love Minu. I, we've never had her on. We've tried to connect a couple times, uh, but she's, I mean, she's always so busy and never home. It, once she starts uh, uh, conference season, it just doesn't stop for her. Uh, it'll and be for really any of nice. your listeners who, you know, just so we don't get too insider baseball, I mean, yeah. Rami, yes. you know, amazing educator came up through the Philadelphia system, has a book herself out and yep. now is the director of education in Minecraft uh, at Microsoft. So uh, she, she's just Thank this you. amazing thought leader, um, super just, living in like 31 28 and just going to come back and visit us <laughs> in 2019 to give this talk <laughs> <laughs> that's so exciting yes she's amazing, amazing too like a really really awesome beautiful person too i've been mean, just like one-on-one -on -one great conversations with her she seems really inspiring like people when they talk to her and they're around her she gets people pumped about learning and growing and developing and that's that's always pretty pretty cool uh, so Minu at Badge Summit. Wow. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. And, and you know, so hopefully a lot of your listeners will be able to check it out again, bit.ly slash uh, Badge Summit. And we'll also work up a, a giveaway maybe that we can throw up on, on the webpage, get, give some free passes away to, to some on education listeners, if that's okay with you guys. I think we should totally do that. Absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> and I think we'll we'll run out we'll run a couple ad spots. We have we have a little bit of room, uh, so we'll we'll make sure that people are reminded of it every time they listen, so that because uh, we know a lot of our listeners go to ISTE. Uh, listen, guys, stay an extra day, come a little bit early, go to Temple and talk about achievements and badging because it's 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 such a cool topic and it gets you really excited about engagement and and uh, getting kids excited about learning. Uh, so that's that's a lot of fun. Speaking of something that's exciting, Woo! we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start a new reoccurring segment with Noah. Noah is going to join us at the end of every month. Uh, now every month, as long as Noah you know stays interested in it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're gonna do a segment called "Dig It or Ditch It." Uh, Noah, tell us what. What is dig it or ditch it? Well, dig it or ditch is, you know, it's really just based on the idea of, you know, are we buying or selling? Are we into an idea? Are we over an idea? And so each month I'm going to be joining you all, going to be throwing out some topics that uh, we've decided are not going to be prearranged. So you're just going to riff off the top of your We're head. Flying and, blind. 
We're flying blind, so I'm going to throw a topic and ask you dig it or ditch it, and then the three of us will riff on it for a moment before going on to the next topic. This is going to be so cool. Super exciting. So we're going to, you have prepared, so I think we're going to do- We're going to do our first one. We're going to have a theme song, hopefully. We might we might be able to introduce we some fun game show insert music. insert it right here. Welcome to Dig It or Ditch It. Yes. I think I did that on cue. <laughs> and Noah has uh, some topics. And so let's let's do it. Dig it or ditch it. Let's go. All right. First topic for you, gentlemen. I know you love to get political on your show. So we'll start out with exploring antitrust investigations with Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Dig it or ditch it? Ditch it. Ooh, man. That's... That's so far ditch it. Oh. I don't even want. I don't even want to get into that. <laughs> oh, but you're ditching it for the wrong reasons. I think. Me? Yeah, you just okay, don't want to. You don't want to touch it. I think that successful companies are successful because they're really good at what they do, and it's really hard for me to justify, for example, breaking up Amazon. This guy started the company in his freaking garage. I mean, he's just. They're really good at it. So. I have a hard time breaking up Amazon, for example, because just because they're good. Like, are we, is that really what we're doing? Hot take. <laughs> Come on, Glenn. Just because you're good, we're going to break you up. It's no, the... I don't know. Come yeah, on, I'm, Glenn. I'm still ditching it. Still ditching it because you, you don't want to touch it. I think we need to learn more, and that's the point of the investigation. I'm going to dig it. I, I think we need to look at certain aspects of it. You know, are monopolies happening? And is it what's best for consumers and, and just humans, um, you know, in North America and worldwide? Yes. Great take. Next topic, Snapchat, dig it or ditch it? Ditch it. I actually say dig it. We need to, I think, and the reason why is I think that we are instantly turned off by it because Snapchat's original name, like nickname, was really nasty. If people don't know that already, why, what was why it? Be? I'm not, I can't say it on air. Oh, but I'm just okay. saying the purpose of a, you know Snapchat and the way that it's being currently used a lot of the time is really just a consumption of garbage. But as we had just talked to Nate Green uh, last week, that is the space that people are living in right now. By people, I mean our students. We should mm. definitely engage in that space and figure out what are great ways to be able to produce content in those spaces that is not garbage. That is something much more that meaningful than that original name of Snapchat, nickname of Snapchat. That's a, that's a really good teacher <laughs> answer for that question. It is. And I, it's what I believe, though, too. I, yeah. I say ditch it because I hate using it because its interface is terrible. Oh. Uh, but... <laughs> also, I I don't like the I don't like Get the um yes absolutely, <laughs> but I also don't like the way that it um programs kids to to keep using it. I I I have a problem with. I'm becoming more aware of things like you know your notifications and your Facebook badges and and you know these these things that um constantly want you to keep looking at them like the streak so the big problem i have with snapchat chat is the the streak you know about this right where you get yeah, uh you. you gotta look at it every it's day and every day you know and if you don't you lose your streak and so it, it forces kids to, to be constantly I, I get that they it's do it gamification so, they're doing but it so well you want to break them up let's let, come on no i have oh. a student right now who's uh <laughs> a, a, a military veteran and he and he was actually sharing it on the streaks that it's huge with guys who are and i guess women also who are deployed overseas oh yeah in, in servicemen and women that, that that's like a real challenging thing to be able to get near where you have internet to keep your streak alive on snapchat Keep the streak oh alive. God, and they're that. keeping it for two and three years right it was a, it's wow. a big deal if you if you lose your streak um personally i i was strong dig for a lot for a long time on, on snapchat not just as a communication tool but just as a content creation tool even you know mm -hmm. for educators i thought it was amazing you could create even if you're not going to broadcast download it to your camera roll and then you know use it in class and then i was kind of ditch it because i just didn't see the point in it anymore sort of okay. like using facebook in class and then things like edmodo schoology google classroom came around you didn't need it and says so like you know instagram's already doing everything snapchat's doing now so i was kind yeah. of ditching it but now i'm back to digging it and it's just mm -hmm. Based on mm. conversations with young people, and it's for the reasons you just suggested that not just consuming garbage, but actually they're consuming a lot of news. They tried mm. to do news yes. like officially on it too. 
Yeah, I just had a conversation yeah. uh, at a conference th- this week with a teenager who t- was telling me how he gets most of his news from Snapchat, and he was really thoughtful Wild. about it. So I'm digging. I th- I came prepared to say I was ditching it, Damn. and as of Friday, yeah. I had to change my answer. I'm digging it. Wow, that's that's awesome. Hey, I, you, I enjoy you were that. You, to the I enjoyed that you were prepared a week in advance for this. I know. <laughs> this is getting serious. <laughs> I had to procrastinate on lesson planning, so I was getting ready for digging or ditch it. <laughs> Uh, next topic, <laughs> dig it or ditch it, guys. The word should. Should. Hmm. In what context, Noah? Just in general? Using the word should. Like Glenn should have stronger hot takes on <laughs> antitrust. I'm trying to think whether or not I would dig or ditch that. Um, I'm going to dig the word should. I, c- I could ditch that word. I'm with Glenn on it. I'm it, ditching. Cause it's, cause it's, yeah, hmm. because I, I was thinking about ditching it because of how it sounds like a command, you know, it sounds like something forceful versus bringing people into whatever it is that you're trying to bring into. So for example, I I think I'm thinking of it as in teacher talk against standards, students should be able to blah, 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 whatever it might be. That's an an interesting statement there too. Uh, But yeah, no, I, what do you think there, Mike? Because you I, said ditch. I'm changing my mind. Or, or dig, sorry. I did say dig. I'm I, I'm I'm saying to myself all of the sentences that I would use that I personally would use the word should in. And the one that's coming up the most right now, only because we've just talked about it a little bit earlier, is that I should work out more. And oh, yeah. I don't want to say I should work out more. I should be saying I'm going to work out more or I will work out more. Or even I don't mind in I this case to. saying I want to or I have to work out more. Hmm. And so saying should leaves you room to not do ah, it. I like that. And I think that for that reason, I'm ditching the word should. <laughs> And we're we're going to be ditch, ditch, ditch on this one. I, I'm also cool. ditching it. You know, I, especially, you know, in, in education, we think about, you know, sharing with colleagues, using s- s- phrases that start with things like you should, you need to, you have to, you can't, I think are just a lot of times going to be non-starters. And, mm-hmm. you know, especially if we're, if you're in a leadership position of coaching, um, it's just, I, I'm not a fan of, of starting things with should. There, there's just so many better words that are better ways to communicate your message in a way that might be heard and received the way you want it to be. I like that. Next topic, Mike, yes. speaking of hot takes, you've said a few Ooh, times, this is a great hot. hot take question. Cool. Retweet culture, dig it or ditch it. Oh my God. Here we go. <laughs> That's a, such a good one, Noah. <laughs> Glenn? No, <laughs> that I'm is like, a cop out. I, you I, I want you, you, this I want you to say it first. I actually first. have... I have a I have a uh, strong position in this, so I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna oh I'm scared. I think you're gonna gang up on me. I'm gonna dig it, uh, but only in the sense that I think I love sharing things that resonate with me, and so I I retweet things that I I like and that I appreciate and that I find valuable uh, that I think other would people other people would find valuable. I think one of the things that's changed recently in the last year or so is, you know, as my follower account has increased, I'm probably a little more conscious of what I'm sharing. You guys both have more followers than I do. So maybe this is um, something that changes even as you get into the, uh, even to a higher follower account. What, what say you? I am saying big time dig <laughs> and, yeah, and I think you Noah's actually on, retweet a and lot I, and i think Noah's on the opposite end but here's here's my reasoning for retweeting when i see something especially someone tags me in something mm-hmm. unless it's uh, unless it's garbage which very few things have ever been i've ever been tagged on that i'm anti basically against then i will like and retweet that thing because i want to amplify that person's voice a lot of the times we have people that. I'm following or that are tagging me that like you just said, Mike, they may only have four or 500 people that are following them. Mm -hmm. This is a way for their voice to go and get heard. Sometimes I even retweet and this is strange because Mike just said something, but I actually do it differently. Uh, I actually retweet some stuff that I disagree with. Um, And the reason why, again, is because I don't want it to just always be like Glenn's passion voice whatever it might be it's like things that are compelling yes but i may not actually agree with the specifics of it uh it's just that i want to say hey 
there is a good uh, discussion to be had here. Um, it doesn't have to be the things that I'm always all about, you know, those things. And I actually like when I retweet something and if someone counters that argument with something better than I could have actually said. So they're like, they come in with something. There's just a smarter voice, I think. And that's great. So that there's actually a really good dialogue and discussion happening. I know that Noah probably has a different take. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because I totally agree with you, Glenn, and I'm hardcore no. ditch on retweet culture. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. Amplification is a huge um, you know, service to the profession, to other people. And dialogue is really important and valuable. And I don't think that that's really a part of current retweet culture. And that's why I'm a ditch. If, okay. if, if that dialogue piece was there, I would be a dig. And, and so while I am a fan of retweets, I, I, I am ditching retweet culture as it is. I think that, you know, we have, you know, going back to Mike's word of hot take, we have hot take kind of happening with retweet culture where we have a lot of really smart people who are, you know, very quickly forming opinions and in influencing others without mm -hmm. getting enough information, right? That because it's not retweet with a quote, you know, in a comment, it's just retweet, right? And so you'll see somebody mm -hmm. share an article, especially somebody with, you know, as Mike referenced, a lot of followers might share a, an article with a clickbaity headline that just is misleading or, you know, maybe even just dangerous to, to you know, teaching and learning. And all of a sudden you have a lot of people giving a hot take retweet liking it and it amplifies it that even voice. though it's not a message that really ought to be amplified especially since people are amplifying it without having gone beyond like the that. headline that uh, i could see that yep, i i, could, uh, I can definitely see that you know in a world of of fake news and and influence in elections and social media outrage and all that stuff i think a little digital citizenship goes a long way and um you know, the more we can be conscious of what we're retweeting and how we're doing it, I think the better that that makes everyone better for sure. You do understand I'm still going to retweet, right? <laughs> uh, most of my tweets are retweets. I, I, I can dig, I can uh, practice uh, you know, retweeting without that. digging the retweet culture. <laughs> And I also, th you know, I, I'm co personally consciously making an effort to do more of retweeting with a comment. Sure. Right. So I'm not That's just, smart. it's not just ditching retweet, it's ditching retweet culture. I like that. You got one more? One more for you guys. All right. All right. App smashing. I dig app smashing. Okay, tell us more, Mike. About the oh, you think <laughs> I'm giving you time to think about it. You're supposed to be able to like, boom, boom, boom. Anyways, app smashing, I, I still like it because there's lots of cool apps and lots of ways you can smash them together. And I used to tell people all the time, and I've said it on the podcast, that if I only had one app to use... I would use, oh, no. I, I said it all the time. Expl I would use explain everything uh, and I could, I could use explain everything for everything. I really I, could. You I, love that product. I, I think explain everything. <laughs> that's who should be a sponsor of on education. <laughs> um, they don't need it actually. That's I guess the why. Um, but that being said, I, I like when you can take things like videos or audio from different things and put them into some other app or take something from Google maps or, something like that and put it into another app and using multiple re don't we talk about this a lot using multiple resources and tools as long as it's effective as long as it's doing things in the best way possible for outcomes and student learning what do we care so the term app smashing to me is so 2012 and it is I an want, old term and i and 100%. i want to i want to smash it out of here <laughs> the, the term or the and act of using multiple apps the, to do the, work the act doesn't even matter mike here's the the part that i don't like about it is that anytime at conferences if you check out check out isti check out the uh, ties conference check out these conferences the sessions that are attended the most and the, and then uh, the dichotomy the sessions that are attended the least have something to do with an easy application of an app. Those are the most attended. It's like, oh my gosh, I can actually learn. Oh, this is the new tool. I'm going to be able to do this and this with it. And then I'm going to be able to uh, share it with whoever, whoever. The ones that are attended the least are basically things that have to do with 
pedagogy, deeper thinking, uh, philosophy, you know, as far as in your classes, I think those receive less attendees. And it's just because of that, that, that hot take culture where it's like, and it seems easier too. it's easy for us to take, Hey, I'm going to smash this thing with this thing. And that term is like, Oh yeah, I can actually, I can make it happen. But does that result in actual student learning? Hell no, unless you actually have a good teacher who who knows the steps and being able to go ahead and make it happen in their classroom. So even your app that you were just talking about, explain everything, Mike, it can be used really badly in, in the, the hands of a terrible teacher, a terrible app, a good That's app what can, I'm be saying. Ter- can be terrible. But, but, those teach- but those teachers then think. I'm actually doing something that's innovative, that's blah, 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 whatever might be the the hot words. And they're probably not. And maybe even worse, that's what I tell people. They may actually be doing something to the detriment of student learning instead of just handing out something paper-wise or a traditional method of teaching by using one of these apps or smashing these things, whatever might be. It actually is resulting in less student learning. So that's the reason why I would ditch that. (laughs) Do you know, it's so interesting. I'm a ditch and my ditch is for reasons. It's a combination of both of yours. Oh, um, I, I, I'm a ditch because of the, you know, as Glenn called it, 2012. Hey, that is so hashtag 2012. <laughs> you know, th- I think we're in a place where we don't need to be. It doesn't need its own name. It doesn't need mm-hmm. to be glorified as we are at smashing. I think we're I'm ditching it because it's called what we do. Mm-hmm. And so going back to what Mike was Good saying, you know, I, I look at uh, it's not at snatching. It's just how teaching and learning is done. It doesn't need to be its own yeah, name. Yeah. It should be an expectation. And the expectation should be, as you were saying, Glenn, that we're doing it well. Because, yes. um, you know, somebody was blowing my mind a little bit at this conference that I was at this week, this language teacher conference where they were describing it as, you know, it's kind of, you know, what the why they told us algebra is important. You know, it's not when a kid, when we used to say, well, we're never going to use it. And they'd say, no, you might not ever use the math, but you're going to use the thinking processes. You're going to use the problem solving skills that there's no one right way to make this happen. And app smashing is like this, you know, kind of almost um, tactile, physical way using digital tools, of course, of finding more than one right way to to reach the the answer that you're looking for in order to get stuff done. So I'm I'm all about the process, but I'm ditching the term. Awesome, man! This is a fun segment. We should do this again. We should do this again. <laughs> in fact, we will do this again. So I love it, friends. That was dig it or ditch it. We hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for the next dig it or ditch it, which will happen. At the end of April. So, Noah Geisel, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. Thanks for letting everybody know about Badge Summit. Hope to meet lots of folks in person, face to face in June. Looking forward to April. If anybody has uh, their hot take questions they want to see on next month's Dig It or Ditch, it, feel free to tweet them at me at Senor G. And, fellas, always glad to be with you. Thanks, Noah. Ciao, guys. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, We'd love if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast or Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost and this helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and we'll see you soon.